Blue and you join me today in the Norfolk village of Pullham St Mary. The village is located about 13 miles south of Norwich. And today I'm going to take a little look at an aspect of Britain's aviation heritage. And that's the great airships that once roamed our skies. The airship station at Pullham was founded in 1912 and it became known as RNAS Pullham or Royal Naval Air Services Pullham. The RNAS merged in 1918 with the Army's Royal Flying Corps to create the RAF or Royal Air Force. The airfield remained in operation until 1958 when it closed and the area today has been returned to agriculture and farmland. But there's still an airship in the village if you know where to look. The village sign is the only reminder to the great airships which used to fly over the village. The airship shown is an R34 and there's a plaque at the bottom of the sign which actually commemorates the first crossing of the Atlantic east to west and the first double crossing of the Atlantic back in 1919 by air. Now the captain of, the, of that airship was a man called Major George Scott and he was accompanied on that trip by 32 men, 10 officers and 22 um, airmen. One of the officers was a man called Brigadier General Edward Maitland and he wrote an account of the crossing from East Fortune near Edinburgh um, on the 2nd of July all the way to Mineola in New York and then back to Pullham arriving on the 13th of July. And here are some narrated extracts from that journal. The log of HMA R34. Journey to America and back. Wednesday, July the 2nd, 1919. Midnight on a wet and windy night in July, and the big airship station at East Fortune is all agog with bustle and excitement. The moment, eagerly anticipated for weeks past, has at last arrived. An R-34, Britain's largest and most efficient rigid airship, is about to start upon her 3,000 miles journey across the Atlantic, bound for Long Island, New York. At 1am, the crew of eight officers and 22 men climb aboard, dressed in their flying clothes, having had an excellent dinner to fortify them for their long journey. 2pm. Scott comes to my hammock to tell me that there's a stowaway on board. Just before starting, it had been decided that one of the members of the crew, AC2 WW Ballantyne, must be left behind, the numbers being limited of necessity to 30. Ballantyne, on his own confession, hid himself in the darkness high up above the keel on one of the longitudinal girders between the gas bags and has just emerged from his hiding place. He says he could not bear the thought of being left behind. Without his weight we could have carried 200 pounds more petrol and of course he has been allotted neither food nor hammock. Had there been land beneath us instead of the ocean we would put him off at once in a parachute but as we are now well out in the Atlantic, there is nothing for it but to take him across and make the best use of his services. Found a tabby kitten in four part of Kiel and recognised it as the one that was with us on our 21-hour flight from Inchinan to East Fortune. 5.40pm. Scott increases height to 2,000 feet to fill the gas bags which have cooled down. At this height we find ourselves well over the clouds and the view is enchanting. As far as the eye can see, a vast ocean of white fleecy clouds ending in the most perfect of cloud horizons. We feel in a world of our own up here amidst this dazzling array of snow-white clouds. No words can express the wonder, the grandeur or the loneliness of it all. One must experience these joys for oneself before one can even begin to realise them. 9.30pm Thunderstorms by day are bad enough, but at night they're particularly unpleasant and the ship vibrates from bow to stern. We wear our parachutes and life bouts are all ready. Our only bottle of brandy fell out of the chart locker with a crash during one of these vertical bumps, fortunately without breaking. 9.20am, over Hazelhurst Field. 
It's a bright, clear morning, and we can see a long line of motor cars of every sort and size streaming out from New York to see us come in. Pritchard descends via parachute, Greenland and Luck helping him through the window of the forward car. After about 150 feet, the parachute opens well. Pritchard makes a good landing and can claim to be the first man to land in America by means of the air. 9.40 a.m. Scott makes a complete circuit of the ground, carefully balances up his ship, and then, with perfect judgment, brings her down gently into the hands of the U.S. soldiers and sailors who form the landing party. Our actual time of landing is 9.54 a.m. Our total time for this outward journey from East Fortune to Mineola, New York, is 108 hours, 12 minutes. During these three days, the airship has been moored out in the open on the landing ground at Mineola. The system employed was the free three-wire system, where all three wires are brought to a common ring in the centre on the ground. During the day, it was the custom to haul the ship down and hold by manpower so that the necessary work on engines, etc., could be carried out. Long Island, New York, to Pullham, Norfolk. Wednesday, July the 9th, 1919. 11.30 p.m., New York, summertime. It's very dark, and the wind is gusting up to 30 miles an hour on the ground. Our final preparations are made in the ghostly light of powerful searchlights, which are concentrated on the ship, both fore and aft, clearly showing up the United States soldiers who form the handling party. 11.54 p.m. We're away. A great cheer comes up to us as we rise into the sky and steer straight for New York, having promised to fly over the city before heading out into the Atlantic. Again, that strange feeling of loneliness, as sudden as it is transient. 8.30 p.m. Pritchard goes to sleep under the dining room table while the second watch come in for their supper. This position seems to be the most sought after in the ship. The gramophone is a real pleasure on this homeward journey, a magnificent instrument presented to Scott by Mr. Edison. 7.05 p.m. Passing through wet rain clouds, it's been raining very heavily since five o'clock. 8.30 p.m. Still pouring in sheets. The wind whistles round the forward car and it's very dark and dreary. Of course, we can see nothing. 11.30 p.m. Another message from Air Ministry to say we are to land at Pullham. We ask if we may land at East Fortune, as that was our original objective, and the weather is reported good for landing. The reply is to land at Pullham. So we assume there's some special reason and alter course accordingly. 6.20 a.m. Over Pullham. Quite a number of people on the landing ground, despite the early hour. Scott makes two circles of the ground and puts the ship gently down into the hands of the landing party. Time of landing, 6.57am. Total time of return journey from Long Island, New York to Pullham, Norfolk is therefore 75 hours and 3 minutes. Or 3 days, 3 hours and 3 minutes. That account has been written into a book and it's available online and also from the Panoya Centre which is just behind me. Now the Panoya Centre is the hub of the village. It's a community centre where they hold meetings and events and there's also a cafe and a small museum dedicated to the airships that used to fly in and out of Pullham. And the museum tells the story of the R34 and the crossing back in 1919. So let's go inside and take a look. As you walk around the inside of the small museum, you'll discover a lot more about RAF Pullum and the R-34 airship that made the crossing across the Atlantic to Mineola and back, back in 1919. You'll also discover the story of William Bannantyne, the stowaway on board, and a cat called Wopsy. Even though it's a small museum, there's plenty to see here, and the information they have and the photographs to accompany that information really is well worth looking at. I've had a 
great time walking around the Panoya Centre and visiting the little museum as well, learning more about airships, especially the R-34, and the crossing across the Atlantic back in 1919. But I'm down here in the cafe enjoying a delightful latte and a slice of cheesecake. The cafe really is quite delightful. And they do a selection of, uh, of light lunches and other snacks here as well. The cafe is actually located in a former chapel. It's the chapel of St. James. And it was founded here back in 1401 by the local guilds as the Guild of Hat Makers, which is the local industry. And they employ, employed a hermit to say prayers for the guild and for the souls of their departed members and family. The first hermit was a man called Walter Coleman. And the guild maintained a hermit here up until 1547, when King Edward VI banned the guilds and took away their property. The chapel went into a period of decline. That is until 1670, when a man called William Panoya left some money in his will to form a school here. And the school continued for several hundred years and was extended uh, back in 1870 to accommodate more pupils. But today, the Panoya Centre is the focal point of the village. It's a community hub, cafe and museum, as well as the Airship Museum. There's also information here about the guilds, about William Penoya, and about the school as well. And uh, really interesting to read the information that they have here. A massive thank you to all the staff here at the Panoya Centre and the museum for making this video possible. Thank you so much for watching.